Bible read chapter by chapter, verse by verse. All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, again, and uh, welcome uh, to our afternoon study. We are in the book of Deuteronomy, and um, <clears throat> you know, we've been traveling through um, this chapter. Um, where I can just envision what it looks like, just almost like just sitting at the feet all around. It's just this new generation ready to cross over uh, into the promised land. And the final instructions before heading in, but it's also a, 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 a regurgitation, um, a review. A uh, better, better word to be used, if you will, of what they had already not only started to experience, but a review of what was already given to them by way of instruction uh, uh, for their for, for their journey into the promised land and beyond, and how, as a nation, uh, they would live. Um, you know, the instruction was not just these are the things you do, but the instruction all also entailed and encapsulated these are the things you also do not do. And a lot of times was prefaced by what was going on and compared to a set apart understanding where you would be different. This nation of my people that believe in me and call on my name would be different. There would be a diverse and a solidified difference between you and the rest of the nations that surround you by action, by deed, by the way that you love each other, by the way that you treat each other, by the way that you keep each other accountable. Um, and all of these things would be <clears throat> a way of living for this nation that would be different. And there were things that you know, who wanted for this nation that they didn't get to experience because they wanted to go in another direction. And we'll talk about those things. But here in chapter 16, we, we left off, we finished uh, chapter 15 last week where we were looking at, you know, laws concerning the animals, firstborn, generosity to the poor, uh, the bond servants and the debts forgiven in the sabbatical year. Um, and those were also reviews. And he's gonna do the same thing um, with the three mandatory feasts. So um, these, these particular passages in Deuteronomy don't go into full detail, the feasts. Um, they, they just kind of like skim over uh, the responsibilities and the duties just to give them an understanding of the things that they were supposed to do. Um, so we'll read through them. But I also want to get into uh, chapter 17, where we start to understand and see how Yah set up his, his uh, 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 judges, how the Levites and the priests and also the kings um, would, would operate and the instructions that they would adhere to in order to, to, to have a successful uh, nation according to Yah's will. So I really wanna spend the most of our time there because there's a lot there that we looked at this morning in regard to, to Matthew chapter 18. Um, but we wanna start off just kind of looking at these three mandatory feasts being uh, Passover, Shavuot, and tabernacles. I um, mean, we know that they're mandatory because in verse 16 of chapter 16, it says, Three times a year, all of your males shall appear before Yahuwah, your Elohim, in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which included Passover, the Feast of Weeks, which is Shavuot, and the Feast of Tabern Tabernacles or in gathering or Sukkot, as we know it. So, we're going to look at these briefly, um, but before we look at them, I wanted to, to read a couple passages so we can get an idea 
um, by way of review what we're looking at. Um, because just as some of the people, uh, uh, the majority of the people that are being spoken to here in these passages, this is the first time they'll be experiencing these feasts. Remember, there was a period of time where they didn't um, do the feasts. Um, but here, we also want to make sure that we understand them as well um, um, by, by reading through. So if I can get three readers, I just want to look at three passages, um, some a little more lengthier than others, um, just to get an idea of what we're reading. Um, I have Lydia, I have Sister Jerrica and Sister Robbie. I'm not sure which one is raising their hand. And give me one more reader. Sister Carmen and Brother Dean. Okay, so I'm gonna give Sister Lydia Exodus chapter 12. You got a lot, sister. Exodus chapter 12, verses one through 20. Uh, sister Jerrica, Sister Robbie, I'm gonna give you Exodus chapter 23. Uh, verses 14 through 19. And Dean and Carmen, I'm going to give you Exodus 34, verses 18 through 26, just to get an overview of the review of Passover. So, Sister Lydia, um, Exodus 12, verses 1 through 20. Okay, Exodus 12. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe and to Aaron in the land of Misraim, saying, This month is the beginning of months for you. It is the first month of the year for you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, each one of them is to take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the beings, according to each man's need, you make your count for the lamb. Let the lamb be a perfect one, a year old male, take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then all the assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses where they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its inward parts. And do not leave it until morning. And what remains of it until morning you are to burn with fire. And this is how you eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Passover of Yahuwah. And I shall pass through the land of Misraim on that night, and shall smite all the firstborn in the land of Misraim, both man and beast. And on all the mighty ones of Misraim, I shall execute judgment. I am Yahuwah. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I shall pass over you and let the plague not come unto you to destroy you when I smite the land of Misraim. And this day shall become to you a remembrance, and you shall observe it as a festival to Yahuwah throughout your generations. Observe it as a festival, an everlasting law. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Indeed, on the first day you shall... You cause leaven to cease from your houses, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that being shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day is a set-apart gathering, and on the seventh day you have a set-apart gathering. No work at all is to be done on them, only that which is eaten by every being, that alone is prepared by you. And you shall guard the festival of unleavened bread, for on this same day, I brought your divisions out of the land of Misraim, and you shall guard this day throughout your generations an everlasting law. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month in the evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened, that same being shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether sojourner or native of the land. 
Do not eat that which is leavened, and all your dwellings you are to eat unleavened bread. Great job. Thank you, sister. That was quite a bit. Um, but we get the full backdrop of uh, this Moedim, this set-apart time, this remembrance, this reminder of redemption, um, me meaning the total picture is the blood of Messiah um, and him being the Lamb of Elohim. So we have this um, backdrop of what we're reading through now. I want to read a couple more passages that, that kind of um, do the same thing, but in smaller portions. Uh, uh, what happened to Sister Robbie and them? They left? Oh. All right, Jerrica, you're up. Um, are you there? Can I get another reader to, to pick up uh, Exodus 23? Sheena, thank you. Exodus 23, verses 14 through 19. Well, here comes Jericho, honey. Do it. Don't do it. Yeah, I'll get Jericho to read something else. Go ahead. 23, which verses? Say again. Which verses? 23, which verses? Uh, 14 through 19. Three times in the year you are to celebrate a festival to me. God, the festival of Matso, seven days you eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Aviv. For in it, you came out of Mitzrayim and do not appear before me empty handed. And the festival of the harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field and the festival of the ingathering at the outgoing of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times in the year, all your males are to appear before the Adon Yehuah. Do not offer the blood of my slaughtering with the leavened bread, and the fat of my festival shall not remain until morning. Bring the first of the first fruits of your land into the house of Yahuwah, your Elohim. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Great job. So, so here we see um, kind of a uh, the, the pre uh, a preface for what we read in Deuteronomy um, 16, 16, where it tells us um, the three feasts, um, the three gatherings, the three Moedim set apart times that are mandatory, Passover, Shavuot, and Tabernacles. And Brother Dean, could you, or Sister Carmen, could you read Exodus 34, 18 through 26? Shabbat Shalom, um, 18 to 26. Okay, where are I? Okay. God, the festival of Matzot, for seven days you eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you in the appointed time of the new moon of Abib, because in the new moon of Abib you came out of Mithraim, Everyone opening the womb is mine, and every male firstborn among your livestock, whether bull or sheep. But the firstborn of a donkey you ransom with a lamb, and if you do not ransom, then you shall break his neck. Every firstborn of your sons you shall ransom, and they <clears throat> shall not appear before me empty-handed. Six days you work, but on the seventh day you rest. In plowing time and in harvest you rest. And perform the festival of Shabuf for yourself, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times in, three times in the year, all your men are to appear before the master, Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel. For I dispossess nations before you and shall enlarge your borders and let no one covet your land when you go 
up to appear before Yahuwah, your Elohim, three times in the year. Do not slay the blood of my slaughtering with leaven, and do not let the slaughtering of the festival of Pesach remain until morning. Bring the first of the first fruits of your land to the house of Yahuwah, your Elohim. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. So we have in the three passages, we have these three feasts where we're kind of given a backdrop of what we're going to, what we're about to read in, 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 the, in these reviews um, before the children. Um, and you have the Passover, which we explained was a reminder of the redemption, uh, the blood of Messiah, the Lamb of Elohim, Shavuot, the giving of the Torah and the Ruach, because in Acts on Shavuot is when the Ruach was poured out with Peter preached. Um, and then we have tabernacles, in gathering, uh, the wedding, the feast of boobs. So, Let's get into uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16. Just wanted to give you guys a picture um, as this is simply a review of what we've already been through so we can kind of read through. Um, Sister Jerrica, yes, you can read first. Um, take uh, chapter 16, verse one, uh, stop at verse nine, read through verse eight. Did we lose Jericho again? I see her hand raised. Okay, go ahead, Jericho. I, I got it. Jim. Hi, it's her mother, Sister Robbie. Yeah. Okay, I'll begin at Deuteronomy chapter 16, 1 through 9. You call my sister. <laughs> 1 through 8. It says, I want through 8. Okay, thank you. You are to keep the Passover of Yahuwah in the month of Abib, the first month of your religious year, because it was in that month that Yahuwah brought you out of the land of Mitzurim at night. That is the month in which you are to observe the Pesach and go to the place that Yahuwah, your Elohim, has chosen. And there, let the priest sacrifice the animal that you have brought. Do not eat bread made with yeast at the Passover meal or during the festival of unleavened bread that is to follow. You are to do this as long as you live to remind yourselves that when you left Egypt, you left in a hurry and had to have bread that wouldn't spoil. During the seven days, there is to be no leavened bread anywhere in all the land. The Passover lamb is to be killed and eaten that first night. Any meat left over is to be destroyed. It is not to be kept until the next morning. You are not to sacrifice the Passover lamb in any of your cities or anywhere else in the land. You are to offer it only in a place where Yahuwah will choose to be worshipped and do it at sunset, which is the time you left Egypt. Roast the lamb and eat the Passover meal only in the place Yahuwah, your Elohim, will choose. The next morning, you are to return to your homes. Oh, I read one more. Where'd you stop? I'm sorry. Uh, I stopped at seven. Do you want me to read eight? Eight, yes, please. Okay. For the next six days, you are to eat only unleavened bread. On the seventh day, you are to come together to worship Yahuwah, your Elohim. You are to do no work, no regular work on that day, no matter what day of the week it falls on. Where, what version are you reading? I don't, see, I don't have that. No matter what day it falls on. Uh, it's the clear word. Oh, well, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know. 
So that was different. Yeah, for sure. Um, but um, what stands out to you there, sister? Um, just the fact that Yahuwah is very um, specific about his instructions to his people, that they're mm -hmm. not to have the Passover anywhere, but where the father chooses for them to have the Passover. And then the time frame, he lays out the time frame for them as well. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Very, you know, very centered around the place of his choosing, you know, as we as we read through, you know, as we've gone through tour up to this point already, we know that, you know, the first center and place he chose was Gilgal, and then it was Bethel, you know, Shiloh, and then eventually Jerusalem, you know, where the place that he calls them to come. So we see these things, and we see also too, and I think this is very important, that the beginning of these things is out of Egypt, which marks the beginning of everything for this nation. Everything is commemorated about the salvation about their saving, um, about their rescuing, about the redemption out of Egypt. And uh, they're never to forget it. And, and again, as, we, as this is a review, it's also the first time for most of them that they would be experiencing uh, Passover and set on examining yourself um, to make sure that you are walking upright before Yah. And the same for us, we are to continually, if you, if you notice the center of all the Moadi is about examining ourselves to make sure we are in the faith. So praise Yah, um, Brother JP. Shalom, shalom. Yeah, no, I, I just want to bring out again, um, I think this word is, is a interesting word, the word observe. I know I've, we've spoke on this quite a bit, but um, the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, um, it says to watch or, you know, observe. Um, and I, I think it's, it's pretty interesting because I've been, you know, studying out this understanding and is to observe and to watch. Um, I guess you could say, you know, some people may like to calculate, but I think watching and observing is something that's very important. And in this in this regard, you know, Yahuwah said to to observe or to watch for the month of Abib so you can keep your Passover. And I, I just thought that was a, a good word to, way to put it. But I just want to bring that out. But hallelujah. Is there anything specific um, be, be behind the watching, the observing that you want to pull out? Uh, it was just from the aspect of to keep track and and um, to know when to keep your Passover, because um, I know we talk about calendar quite a bit, you know, within the within the body. And for myself, you know, that's something that has been placed on my Ruach is to continue to keep track by by using that visual to observe what's going on. So we're not off place and we're not off balance of. You know, because Passover is, is such a crucial one because it's going to it's going to take you into the rest of your feast. It's going to take you throughout your year. So if you get that one a little bit off, you know, it could throw you off uh, for the rest of the year. But that's really it, though. Hallelujah. Yeah, I think I think um, in, in, the, in the word observe, you know, it's 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 important. Um, and I hate to go here because we do this a lot, but uh, the context. So I'm not even going to dig into that, but the, the word observe reaches so many things. And I think, you know, watch is very important. You know, Abib itself, you know, just represents a fresh head of ears, you know, grain, grain, barley, you know, being that, that that's the time of the sprouting. And that commemorates what Yahuwah calls to be the time as well. Um, that's evidence that his time is the right time. But I think what's more important is that observe in this sense can also mean to preserve, to make sure that we guard this time and that it's not forgotten because of the, the context is, is that he's going through a review to make sure that this time is held sacred as well. So 
I wanted to throw that in in that regard. But uh, good good stuff. Uh, Sister Lydia. Um, my version of scripture um, says guard the month of Abib. Guard, yep. Guard, preserve, make sure that that time is protected, that that time is observed, and that you partake in the in the festivities of what he's instructing at this time. <laughs> Don't yeah. let nobody take it away, you know. All right, thank you. Shalom. Yeah, Paul. Paul even warns. You know, he says, you know, don't don't let anyone, you know, speak again. I don't. I don't. Can't remember the the passage, but you know, a, a lot of times the passage is taken out of context, and that, you know, people are saying, you know, don't, you know, don't 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 be taken away by people that keep them. It's saying no, don't be. Don't don't allow people to to speak ill of you for keeping them, you know, for guarding them, you know. So very important that we understand how important um, Yah's uh, instructions for us are to keep uh, these as He reviews with the with the children before they cross in again. Um, Brother Carmen, I'm I'm sorry, <laughs> Sister Carmen, Brother Dean, sorry, Brother Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah. We are one, we are one. Um, <laughs> um, so, no, um, yeah, really quickly, I think for me, um, this is, you know, in the guard, in the observe, all of, you know, these things just lead me to, um, it just for me it announces, you know, that Yahweh is saying that I'm in this new you know, in this new journey, like I, I need you to be fully dependent on me, you know, um, because he says, I choose the place. Yeah. He said, not only am I choosing the menu, I'm choosing the location where we're going to eat. I'm choosing what we're going to eat. And I'm, I'm, I'm choosing the name where I'm going to put the place where I'm going to put my name. Um, so, you know, for you to choose to eat anywhere else where my name is not, that, 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 that food, that land, um, nothing about that place will be blessed if my name isn't in it. Um, so he's, you know, he's given instructions on location, he's given instructions on, you know, dietary. Um, and then he's making it clear that this is also from everlasting, you know, um, so, you know, again, somebody said, you know, uh, you know, when we're looking at um, guarding from false doctrine, yeah. Um, the, um, and I also think that this guarding from religiosity, because when you, you know, speaking about the new moon, you know, and people speak of calendars and all these different things, there's a danger if there becomes a fixed, uh, uh, what's the word we're looking for? A fixed understanding as, okay, well, you know, every seven days, this is this, and every two days, this is this. It, it's as if he's saying, stay on your toes, stay on guard, stay on your toes, stay in a place of looking, stay in a place of listening, stay in, 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 in an intimate place of me that, you know, even the fact that, you know, that he says, oh, the place that I choose. So even that they now know the food they're going to eat, they now know that they shouldn't eat it between this time, but they still don't know where they're going. So he, 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 you know, he's keeping them on their toes so that the religiosity doesn't set in and that familiarity. So that this is what I see there. Hallelujah. I like that too, because it, it, it removes us away from the ritual of just doing these things versus the heart of them, the heart behind them and why, you know, that this is redemption. Like, you know, the out of Egypt statement, <laughs> you know, where it says, where is it? Verse, um, verse six at the time you came out of Egypt, like this is redeemed. They were literally saved, right? You know, they were redeemed here. Um, the blood uh, protected them from the casting down of the false Elohims that Egypt had in their firstborn, you know, so, so keep these things at the center of your mind and heart and don't lose it in a ritual, you know? So I like, I like that. I like that picture as well. Guard this, guard the understanding, guard your heart. He always tells us, praise Yah, praise Yah. Um, good stuff, brother Jason. 
What you got, bro? Uh, yeah, um, in line with what, you know, the discussion and what the sister just, just mentioned, you know, and we have to, um, you know, also examine the life of, of Yahusha because mm-hmm. he kept these things, right? And yes. it just it just reminded me of what um, he stated at Matt Yahoo um, 5, verse uh, um, 17 through 19, yeah. where, where he mentioned, you know, like, don't think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. He came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And he, he and then at 19, um, it really hits the point because we see, like, you know, um, a, a lot of these uh, religious leaders, they teach contrary to the healthful teachings because he goes on to say, whoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so, uh, he shall be called least in relation to the kingdom of the heavens. So this is a very serious matter that's um, all too often overlooked. And uh, and this is why it's so important that, you know, that we, um, you know, continue to examine ourselves and test to see if we're really in the faith, if we're really walking in truth, because, uh, you know, that's what the Most High desires, is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Absolutely. You know, I, I really like the aspect of what you shared about examining yourself because, you know, we can um, <clears throat> we can get stale, you know, in our walk. We can get mundane. We can get ho hum, you know, with this walk. Up, oh, it's Shabbat again. Uh, hallelujah, praise Yah. You know, blah, blah, you know, and it just becomes things that we do and we say things just because. They sound good without really digging into, okay, what does Yah want from me today? What does he want me to do today? I like, you know, the question June asked this morning. It was really powerful in the way that she said, give me something practical that exhibits this passage, you know, because You know, we can read this stuff on a page all day long. We can memorize it. You know, we can know it front to back, know the address and the location. But how do we live it? You know, and examining ourselves doesn't allow you to lie about your living. Because if you lie about your living, you're lying about your living. You understand? If you examine yourself, you'll see all the holes you'll see all the all the stitches that are off you'll see you know the pur- the purpose of the law was to reveal sin the purpose of the black velvet that you place a diamond on is so that you can see all the inconsistencies in the diamond because if you just shine the diamond up to the sun they all look the same you put it on the velvet and you grab that little eyepiece, you see the inconsistencies, you see the occlusals as they call them. You see the strips of carbon that make it not as pure and not as valuable as the price that they're trying to sell it for, right? So all of us can see the stains on our suits when we line them against Torah. And that is what we examine ourselves by, by what Torah instructs and tells us. Um, so. Examining yourself is at the center of all is Modi. Um, and we're called to do that. Um, and be humbled by it, you know. Um, so praise Yah, praise Yah for, for the discussion. Let's keep moving. Let's go to our second review. We're gonna go to the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. Um, we kind of read the preface. There's some other passages we can read, but we're gonna keep pushing through. Let's read from verse 9 of chapter 16 through verse 12. Feast of Weeks, uh, Sister Lydia. Um, Jerrica, Sister Robbie, you can take uh, Feast of Tabernacles after that. Okay, um, Deuteronomy 16, verse 9. Count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. And you shall perform the festival of weeks to Yahuwah your Elohim, according to the voluntary offering from your hand, which you give as Yahuwah your Elohim blesses you. And you shall rejoice before Yahuwah your Elohim 
you, your son, and your daughter, and your male servant, and your female servant, and the Levite who was within your gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow who are in their midst at the place where Yahuwah, your Elohim, chooses to make his name dwell. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Misraim, and you shall guard and do these laws. Perform the festival of booths for seven days after oh, the stop, end. No, stop, oh, there. stop there. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Praise you. If anything that stands out to you in that particular passage? Now, it seems that everybody is included who dwells with, with you, um, which is important. I believe that you don't exclude people who are among you, but that doesn't mean this you know, people from outside your area. It just means those that really live with you and who believe with you. Right. That's important. They, they, they need to believe um, what they're doing. It's not just, you know, you bring people in that don't understand. They don't understand. You teach them before they partake. That's very important. And I like what it says about the Levite as well, um, because remember, the Levite didn't have an inheritance of land, right? So they were they were strategically placed amongst all the people in their gates. So each tribe would have a, a, a Levitical presence um, to, 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 to also uh, be judges there, which we're gonna read later, um, but they were to be taken care of also by the people um, in, this, in, in this time for this particular uh, uh, harvest. Um, this is a, a rejoicing. Um, the gift of the harvest. Um, we see the same thing going on in, in Acts uh, chapter two um, with Peter. Uh, we might look at that a little bit, um, but again, this is a review of what we've already covered. Brother Dean. Uh, shalom. Um, just the fact that um, <clears throat> in verse 10, it says, and you shall perform the festival of Shavuot." to Yahuwah your Elohim according to the voluntary offering from your hand that jumped out to me um, because even when we're you know speaking about obedience and and the law and you know he'd been very adamant about this is what I require not just desire this is what I require from everlasting to everlasting for, for your generation you know um, from generation to generation but the fact that this word voluntary, I don't know if it's in every translation, but that to me, um, again, if there's people around you watching how you serve, you know, your, your Elohim, how you serve, and, and then there's a word called voluntary, that to me indicates that this is something from your heart. And this is also something that no no man can come and argue with you as to well, what you are choosing to give voluntarily, and it can only be judged by Yahuwah. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know, for some reason, it throws me back to the uh, Cain and Abel um, situation, you know, um, because, again, it's, it's as if the same instruction is given to everybody, but how they choose to interpret it is based on the posture of their heart. So... Yeah, this is that that just jumped to me. Hallelujah. Yeah, and 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 you also read that portion uh, when you read. Uh, I think you you would have wanted read out of Exodus thirty four. Um, it was also in that portion about the, the offering, free will offering, giving willingly um, because of the harvest that the Yah has just blessed you with. You're giving back to Him. So. Um, Brother uh, Jason and then JP. Yeah, so um, what stuck out to me, I, f I, found, I found interesting, is the fact that, you know, the scriptures hold true. You know, Yahuwah never changes. Uh, we see here in, uh, in in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 16, uh, the latter part where it mentions, um, you know, like the, the people that are included, uh, the stranger, the fatherless boy, and the widow. And this, this uh, um, reminded me of what was written in, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse uh, 20, 27, when it mentions that the pure observance and undefiled before Elohim and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So, um, you know, pe people who are fatherless or people who have lost that that support of, of, of having a husband or wife, um, you know, they they often do need assistance. And, and you know, we should always render ourselves 
uh, to, to be that support. Because again, when when, when we do, uh, it's it's actually to Yahuwah that we're rendering that that sacred service. Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> also commemorating, um, you know, uh, always to make a point uh, for us to make sure those are taken care of that are around us that that need that need assistance that need help um, that can't care for themselves. Um, always Yahuwah putting in the hearts of the people to make provision for them. You know, no person left behind. Um, and uh, I want to talk about something else too, but let me let JP go first. Hallelujah. Um, in this portion, I, I think there's two things that I want to mention. <clears throat> Again, um, when it comes to this part of calendar, the practicing of counting and how vital that is, um, yeah. counting up these days. And and the word um, I want to bring out to, I believe, to make a correction on the on the Bible uh, that a lot of our translations may carry, especially the King James. It says corn. Um, when you go into the Hebrew, it's H7054, which is Kuma. And that word Kuma is, according to the Strong's Concordance, is something that rises like a stalk of grain. And I would say that as we've done our research, um, I know me and my family, we looked and the corn is really corn is, <laughs> is really just man-made. It's a man-made um, crop. It's not really something that's been since the beginning. It's pretty interesting when you go and do the research on it. So, so it kind of gives us a better understanding as well as for my understanding is that I was seeing that, you know, we have to look for the grains, whether it's wheat or, or whatever it may be. Those are some other grains that were pretty old, like millet is a really old grain. And so um, that was pretty interesting. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention um, was, um, I love that in verse 11, he says, and thou shalt rejoice before Yahuwah the Elohim. Mm -hmm. Um, that word rejoice is H8055, which is Simka or Samka or Samak. Um, and it's to be joyful, it's to be like in the the strong says to brighten up, you know, to be gleesome or you know, it's like, but it's very important. And I, I love that because Yahuwah's to me, and I guess in my opinion, his feasts have always they're always about rejoicing and being glad and and really for for what has happened because you know he says in because you were a bondman because you were enslaved and even in our modern day i would say in the spiritual sense that we were enslaved to sin and so to rejoice now that we're not and we're walking in this freedom in yahuwah and so i just want to bring those words out but hallelujah yeah i think um i think what happens though jp is that people uh misinterpret rejoicing for partying and drunken revelries um because that that also happens even within the faith you know people go overboard and and they relate rejoicing with the way with the world says rejoice um but this is by by all means rejoicing of what the father has given through the harvest um the the ear uh, the 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 abi uh, means ear or head of ears, which is um, a, assimilation or the the picture of a barley sprout, um, uh, the grain that's being talked about. As a matter of fact, um, there are those that that look for the sprouting of the barley sprout to mark their count. You know, the 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 the, the count of spring actually, the fact that spring has has happened, the barley sprout has, uh, has shown itself. So um, you were on point with the grain not being corn, an ear of corn, but rather an ear, a head of a fresh, a fresh head of ears of grain. Praise you. All right, let's, um, oh, so um, what's also, I also wanted to make mention of is that Acts chapter two, we see, you know, JP mentioned accounting. We see that in full action in Acts chapter two. I'm not gonna read the whole chapter because it's kind of long, but 
Peter is is actually, you know, at the head of what's going on. And he quotes Joel chapter two, where it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, my ruach on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my maidservants and my men servants and maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars and smoke. Um, the sun shall turn into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. Um, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be saved. So we see um, part of that happen, all, although we know this is also speaking of the millennial reign, but we see in Acts chapter two, after Peter preaches, preaches we see the pouring out of the Ruach on Shavuot. So we have the giving of the Torah and the giving of the Ruach in the same commemoration, um, rejoicing in the gift of the harvest. So just wanted to point that out as we see those things. A lot of times people, you know, say that Shavuot is actually the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is just the word for 50, which the count that JP mentioned 50 days after Passover is Shavuot. So wanted to point that out. Praise God. Anyone have anything else to say about that? Before we move on to Tabernacles. Praise Yah. All right. Sister Robbie, you can read um, verses 13 through 17. Stop at 18. Okay, it's Sister Jerrica. Oh, Jerrica this time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perform the festival of Sukkot for seven days after the ingathering from your threshing floor and from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your festival, and you and your son and your daughter and your and your male servant and your female servant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates. For seven days you shall celebrate a festival to Yahuwah your Elohim in the place which Yahuwah chooses, because Yahuwah your Elohim barak you in all your increase and in all the work of your hands, and you shall be only rejoicing. Is it to 17? Through seven, yeah, read 17. Through seven. Okay. Three times a year, all your mel mels appear before Yahuwah, your Elohim, in the place which he chooses at the festival of Matzah, Matzah and at the festival of Shavuot, and at the festival of Sukkot. And none should appear before Yahuwah empty-handed, each one with the gift of his hand, according to the Baraka of Yahuwah, your Elohim, which he has given you. Praise God. So we see, see the offerings and the free will offerings and the rejoicing. Um, and, and, you know, a festival, specifically Sukkot, we see the festival, um, um, the wedding festival, the wedding feast. And we see the blowing of the trumpet or trumpets to prepare everyone to prepare themselves to, to search their hearts for the day of atonement, you know, and then the feast, right? So we see these pictures drawn, you know, by symbols, but also the actuality of where Yahuwah wants us and what he wants us to celebrate and commemorate and partake in. So children of Israel getting this same um, review um, that we are to, to review on a regular basis to understand what these things are for and why we guard them, why we keep them, why we understand the count, as JP brought out, to know when these times are um, so that we can be accurate. So praise Yah, um, very important, uh, these, these, these three mandatory uh, that we understand them. 
um, this particular one, you know, they were living in tents during this time. And we see the gathering um, year to year so that, you know, not only that, you know, we just come together and live in these booths or, or reside in these booths or eat in these booths, but we understand that we explain, that we teach what it's about and why we're doing it. Very important uh, for our children. So praise Yah. All right. So this next portion is, um, is very important. I want us to spend the majority of our time here, um, although we took longer to go through the <laughs> feast that I wanted to, but that's fine. Um, you know, Yah's timing. But let's get into understanding the responsibility of the leaders um, as they come into the land, you know. You know, judges, kings, priests, um, the leaders are being outlined here um, and, 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 and set, you know, before us. Um, as they come into the land, Moses is leading them, right? Um, Moses dies and then Joshua takes over and he's the leader going into the promised land. After he dies, then the judges um, take over uh, through the book of Judges, and, and we know that their accomplishments are inadequate. The judges and the way they ruled was inadequate. We see that in, in, in certain passages, and we'll look at a few later. But after the judges, we go through Ruth and Samuel, where the king's lead ship is birth, set before us. But he begins here first with the judges. So we want to pick that up. Let's read. Um, Let's go through, Brother Dean, if you can, are you, you raised your hand to read? Oh, you had a question. Oh, you did? All right, so, oh, Jason. No, I, I raised my hand to read. I don't know if you want to. Okay, all right, so, all right, I'm gonna let Jason read first, and then Brother Dean, you can read the next portion. Is that cool? All right, Jason, if you can read, um, from verse 18 of chapter 16, read it through verse seven of chapter 18. So chapter 16, verse 18 through chapter 17, verse seven, stop at eight. Okay, so 16, 18 start, right? Yes. Okay. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart she sent and called for the serenum of the philistine saying oh whoa, whoa, whoa. where are you reading judges 16 no 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 deuteronomy sorry. 16 deuteronomy I'm, i don't know why i'm in judges sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well we started sorry. talking about judges so yeah sorry yeah. about that all right deuteronomy <laughs> that's cool 16. Um, i'm like that's a different version <laughs> <laughs> i was wondering why we were there uh, <laughs> All right, so Judges uh, 16, right? Yes, verse 18. Right. Okay, so it says, uh, Judges and officers shall make you in all your gates, which Yahuwah Elohaka gives you throughout your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not rest judgment. You shall um, not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift blinds the eyes of the wise, and perverts the word of the righteous. That which is altogether um, just shall you follow, that you may live and inherit the land which Yahuwah Elohaka gives you. You shall not plant Asherah pole of, of any trees near unto the altar of Yahuwah Elohaka, which you shall make. Neither shall you set up the image Yahuwah Elohaka hates. You shall not sacrifice unto Yahula Alahaka any bullock or sheep wherein is a, is blemish or any evil favoredness, for that is an abomination unto Yahuwah Alahaka. If there be found among you within any of your gates which Yahuwah Alahaka gives you, man or woman that has wrought wickedness in the sight of Yahuwah Alahaka and transgression his covenant, 
and has gone and served another um, other Elohim and worshiped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have command, which I have not commanded, and it be told you, and you have heard it and inquired diligently, behold, it be true, and and uh, the certain that such abomination is wrought in, in Yasharel. Then shall you br bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked uh, thing onto your gates, even that man or woman, and shall stone them uh, with stones till they die. And the mouth of two witnesses or three shall uh, he that is worthy of death be put to death. But in the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witness shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all people. So you shall put the evil away from among you. Yeah. A lot, a lot there. You see anything, anything stand out specific to you? Um, yeah, I see that... Uh, the the two uh the two or three witness rule uh is is applied again um you know before before the, these matters can be established right that, that yeah that really sticks out yeah absolutely that's why you know it was important that we pointed back to this passage this morning because a lot of times people read the Brit Hadashah and they totally detach okay well, where is Yahushua getting this from? What, what is he basing this on? And it's, it's out of Torah. You know, so we have all of the things that are in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, so to speak. We have all of them based here first. And it's important that we make those connections so that we understand what is exactly being said and why it's being said. Because all of this you know, is in the guise of, of, of uh, um, idolatry, right? So we want to make sure that we clearly see what you who is instructing here. Um, Sister Sheena. I noticed um, a couple of things. The one um, going off of what Jason said um, about the two to three witnesses, um, not only is it needed to like, um, find someone of ill um of guilt guilty but they also are the ones who have to stone them first yes to show that okay you said they did this so what do what are you going to do to them and um i think that is i don't know i, I think it's humbling and also it, it may make you want to like just correct them because if i have to if i see someone doing something wrong and i know if i report it that I'm going to have to hit them with a stone. Maybe I should just speak to them. Maybe I should just say, hey, um, you don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> because I feel like it makes it more, it shows the connection between them, but you you don't want to have to do that to someone like in your assembly. And the other one is the, the responsibility of the leaders. Hmm. Like you're responsible for everyone. And so um, with that, with that responsibility, don't don't be led astray. Like don't take bribes. You're responsible for everything. Don't don't sh set up a share because if you do, then they're all gonna follow you because you're in this heightened position. So whatever you do will affect everyone else. Absolutely, absolutely. Very well said. You know, there are so many things here that um, resonate with me. You know. Um, you know, and, and, and that I, I understand as, as, as a leader that I'm responsible for, you know, so a lot of my actions, reactions, statements, movements are based upon what Yahuwah has, has told us to do, you know, so it's very important that we adhere to these things, you know, there's, there's so much here, um, but, but it's also, it's also you know, it's 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 about being, you know, balancing the scales, being fair and equal, having no discrimination based upon status. You know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, churches that, you know, uh, particularly in California that, you know, they'll sit all the celebrities up front, 
you know, and they'll pay attention to the celebrities, you know, more than the other people. And they get, you know, first, you know, but that's not the way that we're supposed to fellowship. That's not the way that we're supposed to judge. There's not supposed to be any discrimination, fair and equal, because someone gives more money, they get to get away with sin, but somebody that doesn't give can't. No, that's not the way that we judge according to what Yah is telling, you know, fair and equal. Um, no provision, no partiality, no bribes. The idea here is that justice is blind. Justice can't see your status. Justice says, this is wrong. This is right. This is the punishment for what you're doing wrong. And it's going to be carried out, <laughs> you know, if you don't repent, you know, so these things are solidified. You know, there's no partiality. You know, if we are to emanate, Im imitate Yah, you know, we are to, uh, we are to observe and we are to do what is just and true as leaders, you know, regardless of the person, you know, there is no difference between the people, you know, there's no hierarchy, you know, we are to judge um, accordingly, uh, the Levites were to judge accordingly, the judges were to judge accordingly to um, the offense, to uh, the sin. So establishing, you know, their foundation and everything that they were supposed to adhere to in regards to understanding what Yah is telling them. Um, Brother Charles. Brother Charles, you there? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we hear you. All right. Um, can we go to 17, chapter 17, verse 1, or are we still in still in 16? Um, let me see. 17. Um, let's talk about verse 21 first. Okay. So, All right. So it says, you shall not plant for yourself any tree as a wooden image near the altar, which you build for yourself. To Yahuwah, your Elohim, you shall not set up a sacred pillar which Yahuwah, your Elohim, hates. So what's going on here? Who knows what this is talking about? Or should I just say it? <laughs> Praise God. I just wanted to see if anybody had, had an idea um, of what to go ahead, brother. Um, the first thing that um, we thought was, um, you know, it's a form of a shrine, but also um, just the season that some, you know, the people of the world are even looking to right now, uh, Christmas. Mm. So that's, you know, that's what you, that came to mind. The tree. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, that could be part of it. The Christmas tree could be part of it. That was definitely uh, Babylonian and... Um, a uh, heathen practice, but this particular, in this particular passage, I believe it's speaking of um, the Canaanite um, practice, which was uh, certain trees they would carve images from, and they would represent fertility. As a matter of fact, um, Asherah, the, 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 the god of fertility, was worshipped. And they would have these rituals and these, you know, sexual unclean rituals that they would practice. You know, who was telling them not to partake in this? Um, do not do what the Canaanites do. Uh, do not partake. Do not worship the way they worship. So remember, a lot of, of what he's saying to them is what they are to do, but there's also what they are not to do. And a lot of that was based upon what was going on in the other nations around them. They needed to be different than the other nations. Um, but the Christmas tree, the evergreen is also part of that as we read that in Jeremiah chapter 10, praise you. Um, Sister Kalah. 
No, you essentially said it. I was just going to say that um, in that verse, uh, it's referring to like idol worship. Yeah. Um, you know, don't uh, plant or, you know, make the, uh, the foundation of your worship anything dealing with um, idol worship, um, especially that of yourself. Um, and I think that calls back to something, forgive me, forgot who just said it about, um, yeah, Brother Dean about kind of, you know, putting yourself on an altar, um, if given a gift or given a talent or whatever it may be, making yourself an idol and putting yourself, you know, first. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but I like, I, like, uh, I like the way you ushered in um, the, the idol aspect because, because it, it, it goes right into chapter 17 um, which uh, Brother Charles wanted to talk about um, the first part of chapter 17. So I'm going to go back to you, Brother Charles. You wanted to look at that. Yeah, Shalom. Um, it kind of brought me into um, something um, Sister Sylvia was saying, um, I guess, on the um, earlier study and what we all were bringing up and um but but i'm just going to bring a correlation and okay. um the correlation comes from malachi 1 8. i'm gonna start there and it says and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice it is not evil is it not evil and when you offer the lame and sick is it not evil Offer it then your gov offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Mm. Would you accept? Would he accept you favorably? Says Yahuwah of hosts. And then if you go to thirteen, this is the last one. You also say, Oh, what a weariness. And and you sneer at it, says Yahuwah of hosts, and you bring the stolen the lame, the sick, thus you bring an offering, thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your, from your hand, says Yahuwah? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to Yahuwah what is, what is blemished. For I am a great king, says Yahuwah of hosts, and my name is, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Praise God the Saul. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, very vital verse, one of 17. I like your corre uh, correlation. Um, yeah, I want our best. You know, we were to inspect. We are, you know, the same way we examine ourselves. We were to examine that sacrifice. There were to be no blemishes on it. Like, don't bring me a, a, a lamb with, th with three legs. You know, don't bring me a bull with a crooked head. You know what I mean? With one horn, you know, no, I want, I want the best. And it's like, you know, y'all knows how we are. Like, you know, <laughs> we got to sacrifice something. We want to get rid of what we don't want. You know, it's like you put a, a, a box at your job for, 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 for clothes and you bring all the, all the, all the clothes that are jacked up and shoes that are run over. No. You know, put a put a pair of brand new Payless sneakers in there. You know, they're good. You know what I mean? You know, put 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 those pants that, that you spend all that money for that you know you'll never fit in again, but they're top quality. Bring those. You know what I mean? Don't don't bring stuff with holes in it or stains. You know, I want your best. That's what y'all are saying. You know, you shall not sacrifice to who you who. Your Elohim, a bull or, or, or sheep, which has any blemish or defect, crippled, no, or that is an abomination to Yahuwah, your Elohim. You know, Israel constant. It's like y'all, y'all knew ahead of time what we might try to do, <laughs> right? So let me speak ahead of that and say, don't do that. Okay, so that's what he's saying here. Don't do that. And then he goes into the idolatry, which which Sister Kalah started to talk about. 
um, that, that we were talking about this morning. You know, we were talking about, you know, the sin, iniquity, and transgression. Um, we were talking about the brazen and open, you know, blatant sin that, 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 that they're committing in crossing the line in what y'all told them not to do. And they're doing it, you know, so praise y'all. Sister Sheena. Yeah, I'm um, going up for what Brother Charles was, was saying um, from Malachi, what we just read in 17, um, about he wants our best. It reminded me of the three verses that we read earlier from Exodus um, about like not cooking a young goat in his mother's milk, because I thought it meant that we were supposed to give like the best and the first. And so every time that it says not to do that, it's always after saying like your first fruits, your first fruits. So I thought that meant like, don't give like, like give your first fruit, not like, a, not like an older goat, like give right when it's born. That's why I thought, um, that's why I thought that that always follows your first, your first, your first, don't, because like a goat isn't still on milk. So that's why I wasn't sure if that was the connection. So when we just read in 17, and um, when Brother Charles was reading about Malachi and, and what are you supposed to give, um, not just our best, but also in some instances, the firstborn. Right. Right. And, and so and so part of part of that, you know, giving your best part of that sacrifice. There was also a prohibition against sacrificing the way the other nations did. And they would sacrifice the same things, you know, in, you know, in harvest time to bless their gods, Odin and other gods. They would boil, you know, the calves in its mother's milk and, and then pour it out over the land. You know, they, they even started to do human sacrifices later. Um, you know, if you ever watch any of those Viking shows, that's what they do. <laughs> that's, that's what they're emulating. So it's placed at the end of the sacrificial instructions as to say, don't do it this way either. You know what I mean? So that's why that's there. Um, but, but one of the other things that I wanted to make sure that we looked at was, you know, verse seven, where it talked about the hands of, of, of the witnesses, you know, that would strike first. And Sheena brought this out. You know, there was also a responsibility, you know, um, for the condemnation that you're putting on the person that you would have investigated, you know, but not just you, the judges will have investigated your claim, right? So you are responsible, you are to cast the stone. You know, that's what Yahushua was saying in John chapter eight, you know? Whoever is without sin, the sin specifically of, of what they were being condemned for, right? So we have to make sure we understand the foundation of Yahushua's words to understand. Now, there's a lot of speculation about that passage and that he was talking about, okay, where's the other guy she had it with? Or, you know, um, he bent down and he wrote all their sins in the sand. And it doesn't say what he wrote down. It doesn't say who he's talking about. He just quotes scripture that leads to the person that calls the condemn the condemned person out would be the first one to cast a stone in their in their um, in their judgment. So we have to make sure we stick with the script, right? You know, we can't go against the script. Where we're, we're not a schematizer. We're not against the schematic. We are with the scheme. Praise Yah. Um, Sister Kala, and then Brother Dean. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Um, when reading uh, is that the second verse of chapter uh, 17, um, or first, sorry, the first verse of how he says, you know, don't bring him anything any offering with any blemish or anything wrong with it because that's an abomination onto him. The first thing I think of is the first person who ever did that. Um, I think of, of Cain, of Cain. Um, and it's almost like Yahuwah is, is, it's a call back to that. Yahuwah is like, you know, don't 
model, not only is he, he's saying a few things, but he's saying like, don't model yourself after uh, these behaviors, which I look upon as um, abominable. The first person to ever do that, to bring him not his best, which is why Yahuwah looked upon um, his brother's offering favorably because it says Hebel brought the first fruits. He brought his best to Yahuwah um, and Yahuwah looked upon his gift favorably while his brother did not, which is why he did not look upon his offering favorably. Um, and Yahuwah was like, you know, don't emulate that because look what happened as a result of that. He began a, um, how do I say this? Like in, in Cain doing something like that, he was not only showing his character and the way his reverence or lack of reverence for Yahuwah, but it was also very indicative of a mindset that he had. And that mindset, it, it, in my opinion, inevitably is what led him to being the first murderer and taking the life of his brother. He had no reverence for anything which is why it was so easy for him to take the life of his own brother. Um, and Yahuwah is saying that it's not just about you not bringing me something that doesn't have a blemish on it as if all these things aren't mine to begin with, but it's more so because it's indicative of something. It's indicative of how you view me. Um, not only is your gratitude towards me for being the one who's given you these things to begin with, but it's indicative of your reverence towards me and towards the things that I've given you. Praise you yeah, and I think I think one of the, the main things in regard to that is that, you know, you hear, you know, the ecumenical belief is that, you know, all way, all roads lead to paradise, all roads lead to heaven, so to speak. Um, you know, and you know, scripture tells us otherwise. Yahuwah says you don't sacrifice the way you want to sacrifice. You sacrifice the way that I tell you to. You know, there's specifics to everything that he tells us in his instructions. They're meticulous, you know, down to the measurement, down to the number, you know, <laughs> mathematically, you know, everything is perfect. And if you do anything out of order, it's going to fall short. And, 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 and in the words of Yahuwah, is abominable to him, you know? So, so we definitely have to make sure that we um, adhere to that. Um, all right, I'm gonna go with Brother Dean and then I'll read, I'll read the next several verses, um, but we're gonna stop at um, verse 14. We'll go into to the Kings, governing Kings next week, but we'll finish up. Um, uh, the rest of this passage up until verse 13. Go ahead, brother. Shalom. Um, so, yeah, um, I wonder if when we talk about sin, um, if, if for some reason in our modern life that we have, um, in our understanding of what sin is or in our lack of understanding, we have a, a, a compassion and you know this thing called you know where we're flawed humans and or, or whatever you know nobody's perfect because here i looked in more than one in deuteronomy 17 7 i looked in more than one um translation just now and the statement that was being made is you shall purge the evil from your midst now <clears throat> when we are speaking about you know um we've been speaking earlier on today in, in the um in service today and um, we're speaking about offense, you know, when we were speaking about offense. Now, if what we're talking about is um, difference of opinion, uh, yeah, that's difference of opinion. But if what is being identified is being identified as evil, and if we're talking about stoning, you know, um, stoning to the point of, you know, death, um, then we need to be clear, are we talking about an issue of evil? And if we are talking about an issue of evil, are we now, are we actually more, do we have more uh, 
uh, guts to talk about sin between one another or, or to argue about sin, but we don't want to dare touch the word evil because that automatically puts a, a, a magnifying glass on our lives because we're talking about evil. We now know we are definitely in a position of taking a position of a judge because we're talking about the word evil. And maybe we're afraid to talk about the word evil because it means that we truly must be living uh, uh, in right standing and in everything in opposition to an evil life. Um, but yeah, I just wonder if this word, um, you know, if sin is, is now having almost like creating a discussion where evil creates no discussion. Evil is, is very clear. This is what it is and it must go. So hallelujah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, I, 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 I did hear some of that conversation and I didn't, I didn't respond to everything, um, but there is no compromising with sin, period. You don't compromise with the flesh. The flesh gets no opinion. You know, sin kills. You know, if you allow sin in the camp, it will kill everything in the camp. You know, Korah was a Levite, right? He wasn't a priest, but he was a Levite. You know, we know the priest comes from the ironic line. All the other sons of Levi were Levites that did the duties of the tabernacle. Korah wanted to be a priest. He felt that he should be, he felt that he should be a leader and he convinced a whole bunch of others to do the same thing. It was contagious. They all caught the disease and what happened? They all died, but his sons turned away from what their father was saying and followed Aaron, Moshe, and Yahuwah, so much so that they're mentioned and they have songs in the book of Psalms from the sons of Korah. So, you know, evil has to be fleshed out. Evil has to be pushed out, you know, has to be weeded out. The separation set apart. We aren't supposed to look like any other nation. We can't be afraid to address sin. You know, and it and it doesn't mean that we allow it. If you allow sin in your camp, it will kill the whole camp. <laughs> I've seen it happen. You know, so we can't compromise when it comes to that. And you're right, sin has become compromise. Sin has become, you know, debatable. <laughs> you know, is it a sin? No, oh, we all sin. You know, we can't judge him. You know, who are we to judge? No, I'm going by what scripture says. You know, we are to have a family. We set the parameters of what that family is. If you do that in your own house, why can't y'all do that for a whole nation? And why would we not follow that? You know, so we have to be very careful about opinion versus what scripture says. You know, there is no, everybody has an opinion of what chapter 18 says. Chapter 18 is what it says. Our opinions have to be curved and bent and twisted to understand exactly what it's saying, not what we think it's saying. That's how other false beliefs are started. You got whole books of faith based upon what somebody thinks something says or what somebody believes something says. I don't want to hear about what you think it says. I want to know what it says. And if it says sin is not tolerated in the camp, then sin is not tolerated in the camp. From the highest to the lowest will be brought down, you know, so... It can't exist. It cannot coexist with a set apart fellowship. It cannot coexist in a set apart nation. Yahuwah was clear about that. Yahushua is clear about that. There's no difference. The character is the same. It's not different. It's not different. As a matter of fact, it's love for me to call out your sin because I don't want to see you perish. Not only do I not want to see you perish, 
I don't want you to cause anyone else to perish. That's important that we understand that, right? You know, I often use the example of my son crawling off the edge of the bed. He thought I was being mean and evil for grabbing his leg and pulling him back. But I'm loving him so much that I don't want to see him fall off the edge of the bed and hurt himself. And at that age, could have killed himself. That's love that puts parameters of safety around you. If I see you in sin, your next action is death. That's what sin causes. I don't want to see you sin. You know? Man. We have to understand what, what scripture says. We have to understand that the love for that we have for each other also makes us challenge each other, makes us inspect the fruit. Now, we do examine ourselves, but we also fruit inspect. Are you in the faith? You know, you're doing this, you're doing that, but you're partaking in this. How can the two things exist? They can't. Well, you got to quit one of them. Either you quit doing the sin or you quit leading <laughs> or you quit teaching or you quit singing. Whatever it is, you cannot do both. You know, very important that we have short account with our sin, that we confess one to another. You know, man, husband and wives, you know, don't come on here talking about what Yah has done for you and you just cussed your husband out or you just cussed your wife out. No, you better fix that before you come on and, and celebrate in Shabbat. Because cause, 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 cause you're, you're saying hallelujah, but your wife looking at you like this. Like, really? Hallelujah? That's not what you just said to me. You know? You know? We have to be short on our account. We cannot be cool with sin. We cannot just get to the point where we're saying, well, you know, everybody sins and, you know, we got to be compassionate. No, we're not compassionate about sin. We're compassionate for the people. And part of being compassionate for the people is saying, I don't want you to perish, my brother. I don't want you to perish, my sister. But that's sin. You're living in sin. You, got, you, have, to, you have to turn away from that. You have to stop living like that. What you're about to do, the decision you're about to make is not right. Because you put yourself in this position, you want to do something even worse and make another decision that's even harder or worse? No. <laughs> you have to do right by Yah, you know? And if we're brothers and if we're sisters, we look into each other's lives and we help each other out. Praise Yah. No, we, we, can't, we can't be cool with sin. I mean, I did a whole bunch of things before I came to Yah. But because I did those things, I'm just supposed to be cool with somebody else doing them? No, I had to turn away from those things before I even had my right mind. Now that I have my right mind, I can clearly see by my experiences that those things are going to lead to death. If I see it in you, I'm going to say, brother, if you take one more step, you're going to fall off the edge. I'm supposed to let you just fall off the edge? No, I took that path. If you take one more step, you're going to fall off the edge. And not only am I going to tell you that, I'm going to grab you and pull you back. Now, if you fight me off and you keep walking, you're going to fall off the edge. But I'm, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm trying to help you here. That is our position. That is what we do for one another. And this is instructed by Yah. I can coexist with you. I'm not going to partake in what you're partaking. And if you continue to partake in it, then I can't be around you. I can't be with you because it is not set apart. Right? That doesn't mean we don't spend time with family members. That means we don't spend time with family members and do the things that they're doing that are outside of Yah. You know, I, I remember, you know, getting together with, uh, my cousins in Philly and, and my brother, and they wanted to go to this place that we all used to go to. And, um, you know, <laughs> my cousin said, hey, let's go to so-and-so. 
And I was like, nah, man, I'm I'm good. <laughs> you know, my brother was like, all right, we're, nah, he, he ain't gonna do that, but we'll go. You know, and I'm and and that's where our our fellowship ended. We had a good time up until that point. And then I went my way and they went theirs, you know, and it's 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 something that we have to do as believers. You know, we don't ostracize our family, but we make it very clear that there's certain things and certain aspects of your life that I can't be involved with, that I can't compromise with, you know, and we can get together, but we're not going to get together today because that day commemorates this. And I can't come and commemorate something else just because I say I'm commemorating something else on the day that this is being commemorated. So tomorrow we can get together and have dinner. How about that? Right. So we have to be very clear about that. We have to be emphatic about that. And we have to stand flat footed when it comes to sin. You know, you know, and if one of us falls, be there to pick them up. Right. But they also have to repent of those things to continue fellowship. We're compassionate with those we love, our brothers and sisters. We cannot be compassionate for sin or habitual sin or blatant sin, you know, um, you know, trespassing, you know, transgression, stepping across that line. We can't be compassionate with habitual crossing the liners, <laughs> line steppers, right? Because they have decided in their mind and in their heart that this is the way I'm going to live. This is what I'm going to do. I hear what you're saying, but I'm good. I'm going to go this route. We have to part. We can't fellowship, right? So that's that's hard and sometimes harsh, but that's what Yah prescribes. That's what he tells us to do. Praise Yah. So let me read um, these last couple of verses now explain why I go through <clears throat> a bit. <clears throat> uh, it says, verse eight, it says, if a matter arises, which is too hard for you to judge between degrees of guilt for bloodshed between one judgment or another. Now this is talking about, you know, in the case of uh, manslaughter, uh, degrees of guilt. Uh, so manslaughter versus murder right? Manslaughter would be accidental. You know, murder would be intentional homicide. We have to be able to distinguish um, the more complex cases would be, would go to a higher court. This is what this is saying. Um, we then take those degrees of difficulty, bloodshed between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy within your gates. Within your gates also uh, means within your community, which was marked by the gates, right? Front gate, back gate, rear gate, all of those things were a part of um, segmenting off uh, the community uh, that they lived in. Within your gates, then you shall arise and go to the place which Yahuwah, your Elohim, chooses. Verse 9. You shall come to the priests, right? Which were Aaronic bloodline, right? You had to be a son of Aaron to be a priest. And the Levites, which were the rest of Levi's descendants, to the judge therein uh, those days and inquire of them. They shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. So. These difficult situations that couldn't be decided amongst the people had to go to a higher court, had to go to the Levites, had to go to the judges, and they would inquire and they would investigate, and then they would pronounce their judgment or sentence. Verse 10, you shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in that place which Yahuwah chooses and you shall be careful to do according to all that they order, according to the sentence of the law in which they instruct you, according to the judgment 
which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. So these are trusted men, these judges, these Levites, these priests that are going to give an answer, that are going to give a judgment, that are going to give a prescription based upon Yahuwah's instructions. So they're not to be finangled. They're not to be argued with. They're not to be, you know, reasoned with because they have sought Yahuwah's counsel, right? What does it say in verse 11? And according to the sentence of the law in which they instruct you, according to the judgment which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the left hand, the right hand, or to the left from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. Verse 12, now the man who acts presumptuously, presumptuously means to be insolent, means to be arrogant, prideful, um, uh, literally turn away from the instructions of the priest, turn away from the priestly instructions, right? If, if, if one man acts presumptuously and will not heed to the priest who stands to minister there before Yahuwah, your Elohim, or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall put away the evil from Israel. Listen, if you allow it to stay, if you allow it to fester, it's going to get caught. The contagion is going to take over, right? That evil will bleed over into the other person's house, to other person's dwelling, into the other families, into the other uh, tribes. And the next thing you know, evil will persist. And we know this is true because, you know, we're going to get into this next time we're together when we talk about Solomon. Solomon allowed some of those wives that were brought in from their conquering and in, in their um, conquests to set up altars. And not only did, did they get other people to follow him, he started following and fell away from Yah. Solomon, who wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you know, fell away. The one who had the most wisdom and knowledge fell away because evil persisted within the gates. Man, put away the evil from Israel, verse 13, and all the people shall hear in fear and no longer act presumptuously, no longer be insolent against the judgment of the judges. You know, one person starts questioning the judges, one person starts, you know, questioning the Levites and the priests, you know, then you got a whole bunch of people say, well, you know, why do we gotta listen to them? They're just like me, they're just a man, you know? That's what Korah said. And he led all those men to their death. We gotta be real careful about those types of ideas. You know, Yah places his hands on, on, on people to lead. The moment they're not leading according to Yah, that's when you stop following them. But if they're leading according to Yah, what is your argument? Because you don't see something the way they see it? Because you have a different opinion about it? When did opinions matter when it comes to Yah? You know, it's not what this passage means to me, it's what does this passage mean? What is this passage saying to me? No, it's what is it saying? Whatever it's saying, it's going to say to me, it's going to be consistent. You know, the moment there's inconsistency, the moment there's a difference, there's a, the moment you can put one over another is the moment you start falling away because you're following some other faith. So we got to be very clear about these passages and what they're saying and how vital they are to our walk and to our understanding. So um, praise y'all. We're going to stop there today. We went way past the time. Um, and we'll get into Kings 
You know what? What time is it? We might as well. Let's get into the next. Let's finish the chapter. We might as well. We're here, right? Um, so we were talking about the different levels. You got a question? Right. Solomon disobeyed God's instructions. A lot of what Solomon did um, was again, Darius asked, why did Solomon take the wives of other nations? Weren't they not supposed to? The answer is yes, they weren't supposed to. Solomon, you know, um, defied that, you know, uh, much to his pearl. So um, one of the things that um, we talked about earlier was the progression, you know, once Moses was gone, you know, they wanted, you know, judges. Once the judges were in, in, inadequate, you know, then they wanted kings. And then we saw Saul brought in, right, in, in, in 1 Samuel. And then David brought in in 2 Samuel. Saul was never going to leave for a long period of time. He being from the tribe of Benjamin, but David from the tribe of Judah was to have long reign and from his seed would come the Messiah. We know that. Um, but very important that we understand the progression, you know, and, you know, when problems arose during the time of judges, you know, they attempted to, to establish a kingship, which Gideon rejected. He was like, nah, Yah is our king, you know, but they still tried to form a kingship. It wasn't until Saul came, you know, after we go through Ruth and, and, and Samuel, we start to see um, the need for a king and, and Yah granting that request. Um, so here we have the instructions, you know, for a king, you know, what he was to do, but more importantly, what he was not supposed to do. Um, so let's look into this a little bit. Um, I'll go ahead and read, but let's talk about it the way through. If you got a question, just raise your hand. Um, but I'll try to explain as, as best I can. Um, verse 14 says this, when you come to the land which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. So Yahuwah, again, foreseeing, understanding, knowing the heart of Israel and how they, they yearned, you know, constantly when we get to Isaiah chapter 30, how they constantly were still by Isaiah's time looking back to is looking back to, to Egypt, you know? Forgetting, you know, that they were in change and in bondage and, and, and finding, talking about the good things in Egypt. Like, what are you doing? You know, they're going to these other nations, you know, making treaties with their leaders instead of going to Yah. He knows their hearts. He says, when you get into the land and you start saying, you know, I was a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you. So Yah making provision even for that, right? Whom Yahuwah chooses, one from among your brethren, you shall set as king over you. So we know that, that Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So he was in the nations. He says, um, and, and you shall set a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself. This, this portion is very important. And I'm gonna make a, 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 a emphatic statement about this because we're gonna see here what sin is. In this passage, watch this. He says, he says, 
verse 16, but he shall not multiply horses for himself. That's one. He shall not multiply horses for himself, not not cause the people, um, uh, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For Yahuwah has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So let's stop here for a minute. Brother Charles, go ahead. Brother Charles. Yeah, praise y'all. Hey, look, you about to go into First Kings, ain't you? I can tell it seems like you want to. I'm gonna just go one one spot and I'm gonna start it. Um because I got a question about this. I got this marked down in my notes. I want to know is first Kings ten twenty eight correlating with verse sixteen. Hold on, I gotta find it there. First Kings. First King, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, uh, I'm, read, I'm gonna read from it. Twenty six, read from twenty six to twenty nine, though. First King, First King, ten twenty eight. Oh, you say from twenty six? Yeah, twenty six to twenty nine. All right, and Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had one thousand. 400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he stationed in the chariot city, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king of Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones, and he made cedar trees as abundant as the sycamores, which are in the lower land. Also, Solomon had horses imported from from Egypt and Kiva, Kiva. The king's merchants brought them in Kiva at the current price. Now, a chariot that was imported from Egypt cost 600 shekels of silver and a horse 150. And thus, through their agents, they exported them to all kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. That's it? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, what we yeah. just finished talking about with Darius, right? So we have Solomon doing exactly <laughs> what Yah says a king is not supposed to do. And there's a reason why. But but go ahead, brother. Yeah, um, and um, the ne next verse, for um, verse 17, it, that, so, so, so since you told me that no, I'm 16, it correlates to that. So 17, I'm going to see if this correlates with what it's trying to say. Verse 17, it says, neither shall he multiply wives for himself. So in 11, I'm going to start from verse 1. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Amorites, Edomites. Sidonites, Sidians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom Yahuwah has said to the children of Yasharal, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their God. Solomon clung to these in love, and, he's, and he has 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after the gods, and his heart was not loyal to Yahuwah, his Elohim, as was the heart of his father David. Absolutely. That's it. Very strong. 
Absolutely. Now listen to listen to verse 14 of, of the chapter before. First Kings <laughs> chapter 10, verse 14 says the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. Made silver, he had so much gold it made silver look like rocks. But he said, he shall not multiply horses for himself, not to cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For Yahuwah said to you, you shall not return that way again, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. So. We have here the very picture of sin. What do we talk about all the time? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. We, we, we talked about how that's the same way Satan came to, Hasatan came to Messiah. Same way he came to Eve in the garden, right? The same way he came to Solomon, eyes the gold, flesh, the multiple wives, the pride, the horses, the power, right? Gold, money, possessions, the flesh, passion in women and multiple wives, pride, the position, the elevated position and the pride. These are the things that Yah said, my king, it rules my people cannot have in his heart. He cannot have this a part of his character. And just as Darius asked the question, Solomon did the exact opposite. Um, verse 18, also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write, listen to this, very important, that she, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites, right? So he wasn't supposed to get a scribe to write it. He was supposed to write it. And as most of you know that write, when you write something, when you copy something down, it kind of sticks in your head. You, you know, you're, you're regurgitating it, you're practicing it, you're rehearsing it. He wanted the law not only to be in the mind, but to be in the heart of the king that was gonna sit before the priest, before the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear Yahuwah his Elohim and be careful to observe, watch, guard all the words of his law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above the brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. And we know that also Saul turned away from this, and, and that's why Yah had to, had to bring up David. So we see clearly um, in this instruction that Yah doesn't just say, what he wants his kings to do. He also tells his kings what not to do um, so that they have a full instruction um, and, and clearly understand um, uh, his, his, his provision and his um, uh, parameters of his kingship. So next, next time we're together, we'll go into um, Chapter 18, we'll look at the priests and uh, a few other things. Or maybe we'll hit a couple chapters next week. So this concludes uh, chapter. Oh, we got a hand. Go ahead, brother. Jason. Yeah. What I find so interesting is that, um, you know, apart from Yahusha, King Solomon was, you know, the wisest man who ever lived, right? But even in his wisdom, he allowed himself to become corrupted. 
which is which is really telling. Which is, yeah. It's so so telling um, because again, it, it goes back in line with uh, you know what what stated at at in Jeremiah when it mentions how you know the 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 heart is more treacherous than anything else. It also mentions uh, you know um, that it's not up to us to to guide our steps. Yeah. Right. So uh, you know, it's even with all that wisdom, it, like it 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 actually brought him down because he 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 was too wise for his own good. Yeah, you know, it's um, you know, you know, you go from you know, and you you see it happen, and um, <laughs> you see it happen with leaders of fellowship sometimes, man. You know, you know, you know, it goes from. Hey, hey, brother Rod, you know, that was a good message, you know, and I, you know, I start off with, you know, praise God, you know, he gets all the glory, you know, you know, I, I put in the study, but, you know, praise God, you know, um, you know, if you, if you got something from that, you know, you know, I did what y'all told me to do to, you know, hey, brother Rod, that was, that was awesome teaching, you know, yeah, that was kind of good, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 I noticed that too. Yeah, yeah, you know. I noticed that people really, really got it, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I start talking that way, and then the next thing you know, can't no other teacher teach like me. You know, what I say goes, I don't care what that brother's studying. He ain't studying like I'm studying. He ain't teaching like I'm teaching. You know, I'm hearing from Yah, you know, and then I'm completely lost because I'm completely not tied and bound to Scripture. I've created my own understanding. Then I'm a menace to society, literally. And you know, we see this happen when when people get their heads puffed up. You know, you know, I want to remain, you know, on the level that I'm on. I don't want to get no higher. I don't need no national, international audience. I don't need to be on nobody's stage. I'm cool on Zoom with all of you. <laughs> I love you guys. I want to keep it tight and keep it right. You know, so praise you out for that. Um but nah, that's it's a progression. And you read we read through scripture and we see how that happened to Solomon. And it happens to so many, you know, specifically now in this present day. You get a little bit of press, a little bit of attention, and now you got you created your own Bible. <laughs> you know, you're not reading this no more. You got your own, you know. Um, you know, so praise Yah for for the way that he instructs us. And, and, and what he gives us so that we can understand, you know, not only what happened with the Israelites, but what he expects from us. And he does it at the same time, you know, as we read through. So praise Yah. This, um, this concludes chapter 16 and chapter 17 of uh, Deuteronomy. Um, so read ahead uh, 18 and 19, and we'll jump into that next time we're together. So. Praise Yah. We, we got a little long today, but it was worth it. Um, I, I, I really had a good time. I enjoyed, you know, just talking through these matters so that we clearly understand them. Um, and we, and like always, we do it together. So praise Yah, family, and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Toda Roba. Praise Abba Yah from whom all Baraka flow. We hope this video encouraged you today. Don't forget to study to show yourself approved and be like the Bereans who tested everything according to 2 Timothy 3.15 and Acts 17.11. We assemble every Shabbat and during the week with like-minded believers all over the world, virtually, and sometimes we gather in person for feast days. We have something for the whole family, including children. Discover more on our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com where you can apply to join, give the biblical assembly needs, and find many biblical resources to help you grow in your walk with Yah. To know when we publish new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Jeremiah 33 3 tells us, Call to Yahuwah and he will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Much alone.